Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. It is hour two of the afternoon show with Bill Arnold. I'm Than Bennett sitting in for Bill today. Going to be here all this week. So grateful to be here with you. And I love how God does this. And I will tell you, he did it today with uh, quite a big uh, bit of assistance from Bill's wonderful producer, Wyatt. But the conversation this hour Uh, It really builds on the conversation that we just wrapped up. We just finished with Pastor Adam Griffin, who walked us through some difficult conversations, how to have difficult conversations with your kids and how to help them navigate the difference between right and wrong and living in a world that so often blurs those two things. How do we do that? How do we help them separate right from wrong and truth from untruth. This hour, we're going to build on that conversation with my guest, Pastor Mike Novotny. He's got a brand new book out. I believe it releases tomorrow, actually. I will ask him about that in just a moment, but it is called Taboo, Topics Christians Should Be Talking About But Don't. So it's going to be many of the same or at least similar conversations and similar topics from last hour. But obviously, some of these issues, some of these challenges are things that grow and manifest in, I guess I would say, in many, in, in significant ways over the course of a lifetime. And so we've got a timely conversation. I'm thrilled to have Pastor Mike here. And let me introduce him to you, and we will get him on the air. Mike Novotny has been in full time ministry since 2007, most recently serving at The Core in Appleton, Wisconsin. He also serves as the lead speaker for Time of Grace, where he shares the good news about Jesus through television, print, and online platforms. And he is the author of the book that we're going to be discussing today and and drawing from and pulling from. It's called, again, Taboo, Topics Christians Should Be Talking About But Don't. Pastor Mike, thank you so much for being with us today. Hey, thanks for having me, Than. Really grateful that you are here, and I'm going to do something that uh, may, may be a little impolite. I'm going, to, I'm going to pull the rug out on you a little bit, so I'm just going to warn you about that, okay? Because I think this is, I think this is a timely book. I'm super eager to dig into it, actually, but I, I see in your bio here that you are from Appleton, Wisconsin. I am. And I suspect that means we can't be friends. <laughs> I, I, I bet I bet you know where this is going, and and I just gave accolades to our producer Wyatt, who who booked the guest. But this happened in the last hour too. I'm guessing that you suffer from the shortcoming of being a Packers fan. Is that is that right? <laughs> I'm not addicted like many people of my wonderful neighbors here in Wisconsin. So I'm, I I think I have a balanced approach. So maybe we can still be friends. So we can still be friends. Well, okay, we'll, we'll be friends unless you're also a Brewers fan. Are you also a Brewers fan? <laughs> Don't ask me about the bucks. That's where my heart is. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, good. Well, that that's good. I I appreciate a little uh, uh, good humor. I'm I'm grateful to to have you here. And uh, let's let's help our listeners know who Pastor Mike is just a little bit. Who who is Mike? How do you serve? Where do you serve? And and how did Jesus draw you to His side? Yeah. Well, God's been so good to me. I'm a pastor here in Appleton. Uh, served for 16 years in the local church. And uh, as you mentioned, with Time of Grace, which is a media ministry that lets me write books like this and be in a, a TV show that goes nationwide. Uh, married to Kim, so my first girlfriend. How about that? Uh, 20 years now we got in, raising teenage daughters in this crazy world of ours. So uh, Brooklyn is 15, and our little Maya is 14. I'm a runner, distance runner, a big reader, lifelong soccer player. Um, so yeah, I'm enjoying life here in the church and sharing this message about taboo. It's really a, a reflection of kind of my own story of um, trying to fix things without talking about them openly with others. And it's kind of the story of our ministry here, where we've tried to tackle some of the tougher, more awkward, uncomfortable topics on Sunday mornings with an open Bible. And God's just done great things for the last 10 years. So we thought, let's make a book about it. 
I love it. And I want to dig into the content as we go along here in the hour. T- tell me just a little bit more about uh, Time of Grace. And then also you said lifelong distance runner. My my dad ran many, many marathons. So tell me about that as well. Time of Grace and distance running. Yeah. So Time of Grace started, um, I think, 2001 as a TV show in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And it's kind of spread um, since then. Uh, in an average month now through the Version Bible app, we reach people in 170 different countries with the gospel. So we kind of try to bring the good news of Jesus to individuals in kind of a, a mass media way. So I'm the second lead speaker for Time of Grace. There's a great man named Mark Jeske who started it off, and I took the baton from him from about five years ago. And uh, yeah, I get to think of a lot of book ideas and sermons when I'm running the streets of Appleton with my friends and my wife and uh, playing soccer here in town. So I, I used to think such people were crazy. I'm like the <laughs> the Saul of the running community. Cause I, uh, <laughs> I knew all the jokes who's chasing you and where's the, where's the goal. It can't be a sport without a ball. And then uh, some friends challenged me to do a marathon and I did. And man, I was converted pretty quickly. I, I love it. I, uh, I, I was a, I was a runner growing up, but I have to admit a little bit of, a little bit of boredom caused me to transition to triathlon, but I still respect you folks that uh, can go out and run for hours on end. I just couldn't quite do it, but um, okay, let's, let's jump into the book a little bit. I believe it comes out tomorrow. Do I have that right? Comes out tomorrow? It does, yeah. Tomorrow's launch day. Okay. Congratulations. I I know that feeling. That's a, that's a fun one. Uh, Available for order now. I know it is because I saw it was already a number one bestseller on Amazon. So that is great. I'm glad for that. It's, it's such an important topic, but why don't you just set this up a little bit broadly for us? I want to dig into some of these specifics, but uh, set it up for us. Why, why this book now? And why would you say that taboo conversations are ones that followers of Jesus should be engaging in this moment? Yeah, I think this book is important because of what happened to me. Um, so I grew up in the church. Um, my mom raised me to know Jesus. I actually went to a great church that wasn't legalistic or too demanding. It was biblically serious. It was Christ-centered. It was gospel every single Sunday. And yet, despite going to church every Sunday and reading my Bible every day, I, I struggled with something pretty shameful, and that was an addiction to pornography. And, oh man, I, I prayed about it. I repented of it. I read every possible Bible passage in relationship to it. Um, and yet I, I was just stuck. And I didn't see any progress in my sanctification. I started to doubt my own salvation. You know, after you commit the same sin for the thousandth time, you tell God your story again, you start to wonder, am I really repentant? Do I really believe in Jesus? Is the spirit really in my heart? And, uh, what actually happened, well, this is actually the first line of the book, is that uh, many years ago, on, on April 24th, I started to talk what was taboo. Hmm. And uh, I told someone else about what I was struggling with. And, uh, man, Stan, it wasn't, a, it wasn't like a light switch that it all just went away, but I saw some just tremendous blessings from talking about the embarrassing, difficult stuff. And now that I'm a pastor, I've really seen that play out again and again and again, that people kind of get stuck uh, in their spiritual lives. They they doubt that God could love them or forgive them. And uh, it's really these open conversations, if we can have more of them in our churches, in our families, in our small groups, among our friends, that can really be a, a game changer for people in their spiritual lives. So as a church, uh, we, we tried to grab a Bible, never for a second water down God's truth, but always get back to God's grace. And we've been talking about uh, marriage and divorce and transgenderism and homosexuality and pornography and alcohol and depression and suicide and politics and race um, and all the other things. So we said, hey, buy an extra stick of deodorant, grab a book. (laughs) Let's let's see if God does the same things in your heart that he's been doing in mine. You know, and I think Pastor Mike, I think sometimes the hesitancy to engage at that level is that it will turn people away, that it won't be welcoming. I, I have to tell you, I don't I don't maybe have the in-depth experience in it that you do, but I, I have found the exact opposite to be true. Mm. I have found uh, that when, that it, it's the fear and the shame that you were talking about that that sort of keeps help away. And if if people can find a place where the the struggles that they have um, are not only understood, can they, they can be discussed in the light of it. I, I I find that there's something so liberating there. That's that's mm-hmm. where the freedom of Jesus Christ can be offered. And maybe maybe say a word 
if you would, and I know the book's not out yet, but as your as your church and as your your ministry has walked into that, t- talk about that. Is is has that been your experience as well? Yes, yeah. Thank you for saying that. I, I think I think Satan's specialty. I, I think he has his PhD in keeping us quiet. Um, be, because the first sin that we commit, whether it's drinking too much or struggling with something sexually or, or self harm behind closed doors, I mean that, that's one thing. But he convinces us, he's so good at this, of convincing us that we're the only person who does this, that everyone would be so mortified if they knew this about you, and so you have to keep it a secret. You know, the church would be ashamed and embarrassed, and people would take a step back, and they wouldn't, you know, break bread with you anymore. And I love what you said, because I've seen that to be true, not once or twice, but hundreds of times, that when people have the courage let's say, to come into my office and confess a sin. I actually love them more, and I respect them more for the courage it took to make confessions like that. And I've been in my own living room. I'm going there actually right after this interview to our small group, where Mm. people who just met each other a couple weeks ago will talk about some very personal things, and we won't pounce on each other for that. We'll remind each other of the cross and forgiveness, and we'll pray and we'll encourage so yeah, that, yeah you know, maybe there, there are some people who are harsh and critical, but I think God in his family has raised up a whole bunch of compassionate, forgiveness-loving people who would love you even more if you told them the taboo things you were dealing with in your life. That's so encouraging, Pastor Mike, and we're going we're gonna to dig into some of the specifics on the other side of the break, but maybe, maybe just one follow-up on that. I mean, you, you mentioned that you talk about all of the big ones in this book, and um, just looking at the list here, anxiety, depression, suicide, sexual sin, race, politics, on, on down the line. It's it, it's all in there. And when I look at that that list, here, here's where my mind goes. My, my mind goes to the fact that something in that list, or maybe something even beyond the list, but something uh, big or significant looms large for each one of us, right? And so, you said something something like we're all in this together a moment ago, and I, I think there um, there's two sides to this, right? We've got to be careful that we don't use that as an excuse to minimize whatever it is that looms large for us. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, we serve a God who is bigger than all of that, and we're mm. we're in it together. So we've got to be able to come together, recognize that each of us has uh, unique challenges, take them seriously, and then lean on each other to to take them on. So uh, what what say you? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to, for the sake of the Word of God and the holiness that Jesus calls us to, there is not a single sentence of this book that I hope minimizes the call to follow Jesus with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Um, It is not, hey, you're messed up, and I'm messed up, and let's be messed up. (laughs) Like, no, Mm -hmm. the Bible says to put sin to death. Mm. And if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. Get get radical that you can eradicate sin from your, your life. So I want to be like Jesus in John 1.14, full of truth, and not have to pick between compassion and being biblically serious. Um, and as you so well said, I also want to be full of grace, just like Christ was. And he saw the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the black sheep of the first century. And he commissioned people like Peter and Paul to reach out to the Romans and the Corinthians and the Ephesians and the Greeks who, wow, you ever read the New Testament letters? They, <laughs> I mean, it was... It was taboo, you know, prostitution was normal in the streets of Corinth, and yet the Scriptures talked about those things, and they led people back to Jesus for strength and an answer to their shame. So, yeah, that, that, maybe that's kind of the goal. Let's talk about the hard stuff, and let's not pick between grace and truth. Let's try to be full of both of them, just like Jesus was. Yeah, so good. The, the Apostle Paul and many of those... New Testament books was very open about the fact that he continued to have struggles, struggles that he wasn't sure why he couldn't get over. But I love, Pastor Mike, where you've landed. You know, true love, true compassion, true acceptance is not acceptance as we are. It, it's it's loving each other enough to draw each other into conversations and, and into closer proximity and relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll we'll dig a little bit deeper, ap- deeper after this break. We'll talk about some of the specific parts in the book, uh, the different topics that are covered. And by the way, if you have a question for Pastor Mike, or if you want to hear a little bit about his thinking in any of these topics, you can text in your question to 877-933-2484. Again, 877 877- 
933-2484. I am Than Bennett sitting in for Bill Arnold today. My guest is Mike Novotny, and the book is Taboo, Topics Christians Should Be Talking About But Don't. It releases tomorrow, and we will have more with Pastor Mike right after this. Hi, this is Bill Arnold, host of The Afternoon Show. If you're like me, and I know I am, you're going to get tired on occasion. Sometimes you're emotionally tired. Sometimes you're spiritually tired. And if you're struggling or you've had disappointment, I want you to know that uh, Susie Larson has written a brand new book uh, to take you on a journey to explore God's invitation to flourish and to heal and to know peace that will hopefully change your life forever. Text the word GOOD to 877-933. 2484, and Susie will wake you up to the goodness of God. Connecting Faith to Life, Faith Radio. It's the afternoon show with Bill Arnold on Than Bennett sitting in for Bill today. My guest is Pastor Mike Novotny, who's written a brand new book, releases tomorrow called Taboo, Topics Christians Should Be Talking About. But don't. If you have a question for Pastor Mike, the text line is 877-933-2484. I'm going to get to some of those questions in just a moment. Again, 877-933-2484. I want to dig into some of the context here. But but Pastor Mike, first of all, last hour, had a great conversation with Pastor Adam Griffin, who's written a book about helping kids work through uh, tough topics and when, when wrong seems right in our world. So a lot of the same topics that you have written about, but targeted towards kids eight through 12. And it just, it just made me, made me think and made me want to ask, who is this book for? Who, who have you written the book for? Who do you hope reads it? And maybe mm-hmm. how do you hope they consume it? You mentioned a small group. Is this, is this designed for small groups? Yeah. So all 29 chapters in the book actually come from messages. I, I preached live on Sunday mornings at our church. So, you know, this is really meant for a broad Christian audience. That, that's what I'm thinking of. It, it could be the person who's struggling with topic A, B, or C. It could be, you know, you're the grandma who your your granddaughter just moved in with her boyfriend, and you're wondering, oh, okay, well, what does God say about that? Is that okay? It might be your, your brother who's an alcoholic. So I'm really thinking of, of people who are in the midst of taboo issues, whether it's their own or someone they love. But the more I've been um, talking about the book here and doing interviews, this, actually last week this idea popped into my head that I hadn't thought of, that um, to me, if I just had one goal from this conversation and someone who's listening, it would be this, that I think this is the perfect book to have on your shelf if you're going off to college for the very first time. Hmm. So, you know, I'm picturing the high school graduates that I know, uh, maybe who grew up in the church, and they got solid Christian parents. They had a great Christian community, a good youth group, a good pastor. But now they're far away from home, and maybe for the first time they're going to see some of these things face-to-face. And instead of being surrounded by people who are following Christ, um, they might be in a really different situation. So, you know, I'm thinking of someone who has a a transgender professor, maybe for the first time, and they're thinking, okay, okay, what does the Bible say about that? Or they lose their virginity, and they're back in their dorm room thinking, how how do I tell my parents about this? Should I? And I'm just thinking of this little taboo book sitting on their shelf. And there's a a chapter for just 10 pages that tackle all these issues. And it's full of grace and truth and scripture and Jesus. So, yeah, of course, I'd I'd love everyone to get their hands on it and give it a try. But I'm thinking especially about the high school seniors I know. I want to get this in their hands when they go off to college that they can stay close to Jesus for the years to come. Hmm. I love that, Pastor Mike. I I love the fact that you wanted to be ready for someone in the midst of it. I just, um, I've not read the whole book yet, but as I, I read some of the content, I listen to your heart in it. The the thing that comes to my mind is I, I would I would like for each of us as Jesus followers to be prepared in advance for our our interaction with those folks. Right? I, certainly, we are in the midst of these challenges as well. But we, as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, we exist to draw others to His side, and we know, Pastor Mike, we are going to interact. We are going to cross paths with people who are dealing with these things. And so I guess my prayer for for your book would be that it would be a way for us to uh, strengthen our preparation for uh, those interactions. Um, Let's dig in a little bit. Let's dig into the content. Um, Also got some text messages coming in with questions for you. We will mix those in. But part one 
talks about anxiety and uh, you write this, you write, when we struggle with depression, what we need most is not a list of things to do. Jesus came to do the Father's will, and the Father wanted you to never be alone. Being with you was at the top of God's to-do list. I think mm-hmm. that is so good, and I just invite you to say more. Yeah, I, I think, so we put a lot of stuff on the internet as a media ministry, mm-hmm. and I think the sermon in the last five or ten years that has had the most views is that um, God's to-do list for the depressed and it's a little play on words because, you know, you think if you're depressed, well, you know, see a doctor and get some good medication and stay active and get out of bed and, you know, grab a cup of coffee with a friend. And these are all actually really good things. But what I've kind of noticed as I've loved people who battle depression is that they're not so great at getting the list done. Hmm. Um, you know, just the heaviness of getting out of bed and being productive and doing it's not it's not that many of them don't know. It's just that sometimes depression is such a grip. It, it feels so hard to do the simple things you know you should do. And that's why I loved what I discovered in the Psalms. Um, that chapter comes out of Psalm 42 and 43, where this Old Testament believer is just wrestling. He's, he says, why, my soul, are you so downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. You know, he, It's like he knows what to do. Hmm. And then he ends up in the very same spot. And he's downcast and he's down again. But right in the middle of that psalm, then, is this amazing line that talks about God's to-do list. And that's where the name of the chapter comes from. God's to-do list for depression is not something for us to do. It's something that God promises to do for us when we're depressed. And that's to keep his promise, to be faithful, to be present, to walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death. He's not going to run away because we're a lot to handle or because we're not in the best mood. Um, you know, Jesus came and forgave our sins so that God would be with us always on our mental health good days and on our mental health worst days. And to me, that's just the most amazing comfort that in his mercy and grace, God's going to be with me no matter where my head is at today. And he's going to get me through it. And he's a faithful father. And man, that just gives me hope in the darkest times. Hmm. Amen. As you talk, Pastor Mike, it, it reminds me of Isaiah forty three twenty one. It's a verse that has meant a lot to me over the course of my life, but it really speaks to that point. Why, why were we created? The, the verse says, the people I formed for myself, that mm-hmm. they may proclaim my praise. And I, you know, at, at the core of depression, at the core of anxiety is uh, so often a sense that we don't belong, but we were literally created mm-hmm. to commune with and have relationship with the almighty God. If that doesn't, if that doesn't give a sense of belonging, I just don't know uh, what will. Yes. Amen. Uh, Let's go to a text question. Uh, Andrew texts in, has a question for Pastor Mike. He says, can you only make progress against sin if you have mind, body, spirit in line? If so, how do you do that? Ooh, <laughs> oh, that's deep. We're, no, we're nothing like a big question for you. <laughs> you didn't, <laughs> right before you small group, Pastor Mike. Come on, on your toes. <laughs> you didn't warm me up with an underhand pitch. You just, you, you <laughs> this was, this was Andrew. Got to blame Andrew on this one. <laughs> okay, all right. So let me all read right, it for Andrew. you again. Can you only yeah. make progress against sin if you have mind, body, spirit in line? If so, mm. how do you do that? Yeah, I would maybe question the word only. <laughs> Um, you know, God has a way of helping us battle sin, even when everything isn't perfectly lined up. But I do think Andrew is on to something. You know, let's take anxiety, for example. Um, anxiety is a, a body thing. In the book, I talk about the power of breathing, which allows our minds actually to think in a more clear and biblical way. Um, I kind of learned this, the, the amygdala, you know, that little almond-shaped mm-hmm. thing in your head, is responsible for your f- um, fight or flight response. And that when you start to worry or feel anxious, your amygdala actually takes the blood from the thinking part of your brain and fires it down into your muscles so that you're ready to fight or take off and and run. And so when you're feeling super anxious, actually your your brain isn't very good at thinking and meditating on the Bible. And so one of the very first things to do is to practice some really deep breaths so you can tell your amygdala, it's okay, There's, there's no tiger to run from. Uh, there's no bear I have to fight in this moment. Um, so, yeah, I, I think he's onto something. It's aligning good physical habits with um, good mental, you know, biblical thoughts, 
which tend to set our spirit to right and get us closer to God and His Word and His truth. Um, I really like that. So that's a kind of a holistic approach that's not just read the Bible, um, problem solved, but it's recognizing God as the Creator who made our bodies in a certain way, and He endowed us with a soul and a mind and tells us to think things that are good and biblical and true. Hmm. So, yeah, well said, Andrew. Yeah, I I love the answer. You know, what it brings to my mind is the fact that I've I've written a handful of books, and I will tell you, uh, all of the major... Uh, concepts for those books, and what I what I would say, maybe the uh, the 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 inaudible but unmistakable voice of God that sort of planted a seed for those. Uh, they they all happened when I was doing something physically active, Pastor Mike. Mm-hmm. I, you know, there's something about engaging uh, the body, especially if it's outside in in God's creation, that allows, at least for me, allows me to have proximity. Uh, with God. So I, 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 when I hear Andrew's question, that's where I go. Uh, Mm -hmm. Get out in God's creation, get in, in, in close proximity to him and get a word from him. Um, We're heading up on a break and let me, maybe just, uh, just a word about the the next part and we'll pick it up on the other side of the break. But part two, uh, this is, this is a big one, Pastor Mike, and you, you touched on this a little bit in your, in your introduction, but sexual intimacy, homosexuality, and transgenderism. Uh, we had a conversation last hour again with Pastor Griffin, and so much of this comes back to identity, who who we are in Christ. So maybe just 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 say a word, and we can we can pick up the conversation on the other side. But how how do we begin to tackle uh, those types of questions? Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> I, you thought think, Andrew's question was tough. <laughs> it's just going to get more difficult from here. I'm I'm sensing this. I think it, it's so healthy to recognize that the kind of life that the Bible calls us to when it comes to sexuality, is not easy for any of us. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, when I think of, for some people to see sex as a good God-given thing, you know, to read the Song of Songs, for some people that feels wrong. Um, To -hmm. celebrate the goodness of sex, to be eager for it, to flirt, to, you know, for for some people raised in conservative Christian environments, that's not easy. For others, they're very excited about sex, but they're, they're straight, and we live in a world with so much temptation that to not lust after another woman is so difficult. Um, and for some people who live with same-sex attraction, or they're attracted to both genders, wow, to follow the Bible's rather narrow definition of what is God-pleasing sexual behavior feels like such a burden and a difficulty. So I'm glad we're going to take some time after the break to talk about this, because I, I, whether you're gay or straight, whether you're married or not, what the Bible calls us to is, is not natural, and it's not easy, and that's why God shows up with His Spirit, and especially with Jesus, our Savior, to help us through it with lots of grace and truth. So good, Pastor Mike. We will pick it up on the other side of the break, and I'm glad you sort of teased it that way, because I, I, I think so much of what uh, can be a challenge in this conversation, there's all sorts of different types of sexual uh, separation, right? The, the separation from God's call to sexual purity. And I think we have a tendency to point at another one that maybe isn't the one that we struggle with and distinguish it as uh, paramount to the one that maybe we find in the mirror. So we will we will dig in a little bit deeper to that taboo topic after the break. My guest is Pastor Mike Novotny. His book is Taboo Topics Christians Should Be Talking About But Don't. And if you have a tough question, if you have a question on a taboo topic, we invite you to sit in for Pastor Mike. The number is 877-933-2484. The book releases tomorrow. You can order your copy uh, again, if you want to send in a question, it's 877-933-2484. I am Than Bennett, in for Bill Arnold, and we will be back with more right after this. The book is Taboo, Topics Christians Should Be Talking About But Don't, written by Pastor Mike Novotny. It comes out tomorrow. I encourage you to check it out. And Pastor Mike, I want to jump right back in. We, we kind of left the conversation in uh, the, the middle of an answer here. The Part two of the book deals with uh, sexual intimacy, homosexuality, and transgenderism. And the question I have for you, and we, we teased it a little bit, but the, the, the spectrum of, of struggles around this issue are so uh, broad, right? We're called to a standard of sexual purity. We're called to intimacy with our creator. And uh, so many of us struggle in different ways 
along that spectrum. And yet this is an issue that in, in some places in scripture, we're, we're just instructed to flee, to have nothing to do with it. And um, hmm. talk to us about that. How, how do we, how do we decide how to interact with people that are, are struggling with this, how to help them with it, and then hmm. how to recognize that each of us are, uh, are in need of wholeness in this area? Yeah. Yeah. I love, you know, thinking of Jesus's words on judgment in Matthew 7. I, I like to start with myself and in-house here with the church before I think about any anyone outside our walls. And mm-hmm. what I find there is, wow, we just need a lot of good, clear teaching. We need a lot of encouragement and we need a lot of grace. Um, for example, um, as I was raised in American culture, I don't know, as a teenage boy, I, I kind of, I, I got this impression from the movies I saw and the shows I watched that sex was kind of easy. Mm-hmm. That you look at a woman and she looks back at you and then there, it's great. <laughs> and then, and then I met an actual woman and we got married. And what, do you, what do you know? Sex is actually quite a bit of work. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's fun when it goes well, but it involves selflessness and communication and forgiveness and tenderness and humility. Um, you you got to work it and, and refine it and serve each other. Well, you have to love each other well to make love well. And so, you know, I, I, I don't want to just, you know, we'd like to jump into the hot topic of LGBTQ issues, but I would just like to start there. You know, the, the biblical view of sex is beautiful, but difficult. Hmm. And so to be able to encourage, because there's a lot of straight married couples, nice families in the church that don't have a lot of sexual intimacy at home. And it's so easy to look over the fence at our gay neighbor, let's say, and forget like, oh, no, God has a, a holy calling for those of us within marriage, too. So there's a whole chapter in the book called uh, Sex is Work. (laughs) So correcting this false idea that we get from American media, that this is all supposed to be easy. It's not. It's beautiful and it's good, but it does take quite a bit of work. And in fact, back to back to back chapters, sex is good, sex is work, and sex is fiery. So if you thought the, if you thought the book shied away from any taboo topics, it does not. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, actually, it's actually a good segue, though, Pastor Mike, uh, because part three is about marriage, adultery, and divorce. And of course, the, the beauty of physical intimacy uh, designed to be partaken in uh, inside of a, a marriage, and yet there's so much brokenness uh, around the issue of marriage as well, whether it's from unfaithfulness or, or divorce or, or broken families. All, all of us have this in our stories in some capacity. And so uh, talk about that. You, you move from uh, sexual purity into the challenges around uh, marriage. Yeah. How does the book deal with that? Yeah. So I, I, this was just a couple of years ago. Uh, I think back in 2021, I've been a pastor for 14 years at that point, and we had kind of back-to-back-to-back cases of infidelity in our church. And what I realized is I I am totally unequipped to help people. Hmm. (laughs) I mean, I I knew the biblical basics about right or wrong, and, you know, there's forgiveness even for these things. But there was just a level of hurt and damaged trust where I, I felt like I was over my head in just trying to help people that I knew and cared about get through that. So that led me to some deep research on, you know, relationships and how affairs happen, uh, why someone would take that step, even as a Christian, when they've been taught for how many years that you shall not commit adultery. And so I I dig in, I have a whole chapter on, you know, how to avoid adultery and heal from it. And then another called When Friends Cheat. So, you know, what do you do when it's your brother who it turns out wasn't faithful or someone from your group? How do you help people through that? in a way that's realistic and kind with good standards and with lots of grace. So I'm kind of sharing my own journey. Like, wow, I I thought after all these years, I would know what to do. And when I came face to face with it, I really didn't and had to educate myself quickly. And I think this is, this is full circle, Pastor Mike. You started early about how these conversations, part of the reason that you're working to encourage them is because in so many of these areas, what we really need is the support of brothers and sisters in Christ to uh, not only have close enough relationships to identify when something has gone wrong, but to uh, have the, have the permission to be vulnerable, right? To be vulnerable, to share, and then to lean uh, on each other. Yes, absolutely. I find that to be true with all, you know, just think of it when a a soldier comes back with PTSD, what's one of the the best ways to heal Hmm. is to talk to other soldiers. Um, What has AA learned? Well, the way to help battle that uh, terrible disease 
is to get in a circle and talk with people who are going through it. So it seems like there's some general wisdom out there, not even specifically Christian wisdom, that God designed us to heal through community. So, yeah, you put your finger on it. That's a recurring theme throughout this book. Amen. Love it. I got a text question coming in. We'll see if uh, this one's a little easier than Andrew's. It says, <laughs> I, I, I think some Christians avoid talking about these things because they feel like they would be judging their friends. Hmm. Yeah, this is this is right. If they're judging their friends who are in these things, can you talk about the difference between judging someone and discernment? Yeah. Yeah, judgment has a bad rap these days. Um, <laughs> I had to look up the word judge the other day. And the basic definition is to say that something is right or wrong or good or bad. Hmm. So if you say, wow, taking, you're, you're a great mom, you're being judgmental. <laughs> you're making a judgment. You're saying, okay, there's a difference between parents and you're one of the good ones. Or that's really kind of you. That's a, a judgment. So it really bothers me when we kind of pounce on, well, you're judging me or you're being judgmental. My, my response would be, everyone is all the time. <laughs> we're we're deciding if things are good or bad or right or wrong 24/7 uh you know every single day. So you know to me the big issue is what what kind of judgmental are we? Hmm. Are we judgmental in the way that Jesus intends? Uh, a great teaching from Matthew 7 where we start with ourselves so we're not trying to pull little specks of sawdust out of other people's eyes when there's a 2 by 4 poking out of our face. So am I starting with myself? Uh, the Apostle Paul, oh, this is huge, would say in 1 Corinthians 5, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Hmm. None at all, he said. God will take care of that. Um, i, I got to take care of our church family. Are we pursuing Jesus with holiness? Or are we overlooking our own faults so we can, you know, just vent about the world because that's easier for all of us? So uh, I think, yeah, the, the thing of judgment has to be done with lots and lots of caution. And I don't think our culture has set us up well. So uh, I'm hoping we can get back to some of those Matthew 7, 1 Corinthians 5 kind of principles where we call each other to repentance out of a deep sense of love, give each other Jesus uh, when someone comes in confession, and that way we can stay strong and be a bright light for this world that needs it so much. I love that you said the first, uh, or maybe the only, uh, obligation is to those inside your church. You know, I think I think often, Pastor Mike, about when I see differences between the rest of the world and the way that I live, I remind myself that I was the one. <laughs> I was the one who said I was going to follow Jesus. And mm -hmm. my offer to that person is an invitation to make the same choice. But until that choice is made, um, it really shouldn't surprise me, I don't think, that the hmm. choices that I have made, because I have chosen to ascribe to the teachings of Jesus Christ, are going to look different. What do you think? Yes. Yeah, I think you're spot on. In, in my small group, um, we often say we can't expect unchristian people to do Christian things. <laughs> of, hmm. of course they wouldn't. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a Muslim, so you wouldn't expect me to do Muslim things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's countless examples, and it's just probably not a good use of our Christian time to just look at mm -hmm. pop culture. Can you believe what Hollywood said or did? Well, well, of course, of course. I, You know, if I didn't have the Bible and Jesus and salvation and forgiveness and, and the standard of holiness, I, I, I probably would do the same thing. So, yeah, it, it's really, really tempting. I, I understand how the Pharisees were. Uh, I, I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. Um, that's so, so easy when we forget that God has called us to kind of look in the, the mirror of his law, um, to be led to repentance and to find forgiveness in Jesus. So, oh man, I feel like we would need two hours to explore that. And it's so, so important. I wish we had more time for that. I love the line. Uh, it's not a good use of our Christian time. One of my passions is that we would grow in the grace of viewing all things in our world through the lens of the true and the beautiful. And I think if we do that, Pastor Mike, we draw others to a saving grace uh, in Jesus Christ. We're going we're gonna to take a short break. After, after the break, we're going to dig into race and politics, among other things. My guest is Pastor Mike Novotny. His new book, Taboo, Topics Christians Should Be Talking About, But Don't. If you have questions for Pastor Mike, you can text him in at 877-933-2484. I am Than Bennett sitting in for Bill, and we will be right back after this. Jesus loves the little children. 
all the children of the world. And right now, there are kids in desperate need of Jesus. Food and medical care. This is your time to become their champion, to change their life. When you sponsor just one child, you plant seeds of hope in their heart, and you work together with people on the ground to change the families, communities, and the future of these kids. You might not be able to change the world, but for one child, you can change theirs. Meet the kids. Find your child at MyFaithRadio.com. Welcome back to the Afternoon Show with Bill Arnold. I am Than Bennett sitting in for Bill. My guest is Pastor Mike Novotny. And Pastor Mike, I want to get into race and politics, certainly two taboo topics. But before we uh, run up against the end of the show, I just want to make sure I get this in. Where where can people learn more about your work? And I assume the book, it releases tomorrow, but I assume it's available wherever books are sold. Would that Would that be accurate? Yep, that's correct. Amazon is the best place to get the book. And more information on Time of Grace and our ministry is timeofgrace.org. Timeofgrace.org. And again, the book is Taboo Topics Christians Should Be Talking About But Don't. Speaking of taboo topics, I I, I, I was interested and um, I, I guess affirming maybe is the word I would use that you grouped race and politics into the same section. I wanted to ask about that. Uh, this is something that uh, our church has been working through in, in quite uh, great depth. You know, the race and specifically racial reconciliation is something that God's word says a lot about. But this is this is what captured my attention. This is what I wanted to sort of use as a hook to get you to, to lean into this a little bit. You wrote this. You wrote, in my 20s, I learned that one way to spell diversity is S-O-C-C-E-R. I love that. Tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, so I live in Appleton, Wisconsin, which is not the most diverse place on planet Earth. But I play in a Wednesday night soccer league where out of my 11 teammates, we come from eight different nations. Wow. So, yeah, I got my friend Mohammed, who uh, grew up as a Muslim in Lebanon. Um, Usman grew up as a Muslim in Gambia, Western Africa. We got Latvia, Bosnia, Romania, Argentina, Mexico, and then like me and one other white guy. <laughs> <laughs> and that that's just been so beautiful. It, it's actually so interesting to bring up a, a topic, uh, even one like politics or government, when people didn't grow up in the same state or county or community, but they literally grew up on different continents. Um, it challenges your presuppositions and your assumptions about the way that things could be or should be. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm super grateful that God gave me a, a soccer story and that led me to incredible diversity. So one of the things that has just uh, thrilled my heart, I, I've been, uh, faithful friends coming from different perspectives, helping me look at this from uh, not just a different perspective, but I think from a biblical perspective and just, just working backwards, uh, Pastor Mike, you know, we were promised in Revelation, every nation, tongue and tribe will stand together worshiping uh, our King, and uh, the, to the extent that we can walk in a realization of of that heaven here on earth, I think I think that's at the heart of what you're what you're writing about. And so, uh, you know, obviously it translates to politics a lot of times, but um, I, I, I just think that this is an area where uh, the Church of Christ is is being drawn into, and I really think it is one that we have a mantle to lead the rest of society. Uh, uh, out of so I'm, I'm grateful for your writing on it. Let me ask you, uh, let me ask you about part five: alcohol and pornography. You've talked about this a little bit, um, but but what about those challenges? How do we lead people who are struggling with one or more of those? Yeah. So every year um, they do this survey of the drunkest cities in America, <laughs> and do you know who is frequently the champion of the United States? I don't. Appleton, Wisconsin. No where I live. way. <laughs> It only loses its crown to the place where I grew up, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Okay. <laughs> and every year, seven or eight out of the top 10 drunkest cities, which is based on number of bars, binge drinking frequency, like seven or eight of the top 10 come from right here in my home state of Wisconsin. Wow. So, uh, yeah, I, I grew up in a culture where you have a baptism and there's a half barrel at the baptism party. <laughs> you know, it's it's not uncommon um, in the culture that I live in where there's alcohol. And, and 
it's kind of forced you to wrestle. Like, okay, okay, some Christians think you you can't drink even a drop. That that's wrong with God. Is is that true? Is that biblical? Um, and then other people, even in my church culture, would say, well, you know, we had a good time, or we had a few too many, and they would somehow minimize uh, the very sins that show up on the same list with things like orgies and men having sex with men and witchcraft and division and hatred. So, yeah, it, it's time for a Wisconsin boy like me to grab a Bible and really search the Scriptures. What what does the Bible say? Can we drink? And if so, how much? And how does the Holy Spirit guide our view of using the, the spirits of this world. The final part, uh, abuse and abortion. And Pastor Mike, this is a hard one to talk about. It's one that is uh, close to our family's heart. You know, we have, we have learned by being in proximity with uh, victims of abuse, also uh, those considering abortion, that so often, so often the solution, the remedy is going back to what we started this conversation with. The remedy is proximity to someone who will provide a, a helping hand to get to the other side of what seems like an impossible situation. So uh, just say a word, if you would, about abuse and abortion. Yeah. Um, well, those chapters were some of the hardest I've ever preached, uh, and they were some of the most fruitful. Um, well, we... <laughs> I could I could just have a whole book of the emails that were sent to me after, especially those sermons on abuse. Um, I've never talked about this. No, no one in my church has ever talked about this. In 31 years, in 52 years, in 75 years, I've never told anyone that. And just to have a really clear message to know that God hates abuse, and he, he's the God who stands on the side of the oppressed and those who have been hurt by those with power and control. Um, to know that you're not broken in the eyes of Jesus if someone said that you're worthless and, and no one will ever love you. Um, but there's a God who reaches to the margins and because of Jesus, he calls us beautiful and, and worthy and the bride that he rejoices in. So man, those the sermons, fan, they made me so nervous because I, I didn't want to hurt anyone more deeply by bringing up, you know, triggers and memories of the past. Um, but wow, it was so affirming to know that when Christians grab a Bible and we pray, God, please give us the wisdom and the words that there's so much healing that if you're a victim of abuse, you know that the church is a safe place for you and a refuge where God will defend the innocent and he will bring his healing grace to people who have been hurt. So, yeah, if you just rip those pages out of the book and, and give them to someone, that, that might be the best part of it all. Hmm. Love it so much. I'm so grateful. Pastor Mike, we're down to a couple of minutes left. I'm, I'm just wondering, would you pray for those who will read this book from a place of uh, struggling with one of these taboo issues or maybe having been hurt as a result of one of these taboo issues? Would, would you pray that as this book releases into the world tomorrow, that it would uh, that it would carry with it the redemptive power of Jesus Christ? I just, just ask you to lead us out in prayer. Yeah. Would it be okay if I, I quoted a, a prayer that Jesus himself yeah. prayed? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think of the words of Jesus in John 17. He, he's there with his disciples. Uh, the heaviness of his passion is on his mind and on his heart. And he, he turns to his father and uh, he says, Father, I, I don't want you to take people out of the world. <laughs> Tempting, right? <laughs> There's all these struggles. God, that's not what I'm asking. Um, I, I want you to leave them in the world to help and be a bright light, but not be of the world. And so I love what Jesus prayed. He said, Father, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And that's really my hope and my prayer for this book, that every chapter would sanctify us. It would set us apart from things that are false and untrue and condemning and shameful. And the word of God would just fill us up with every syllable that God has to say by his spirit and every ounce of forgiveness that we find in Jesus. So that, that is my prayer. I just want to repeat the words of, of Christ, our Savior. God, sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Pastor Mike, thank you for your devotion to write this book. Thank you for giving us some time today. We are grateful, and we are praying that the impact of this book will be uh, in the heart that you've communicated it to us today. So thank you very much for being with us. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Sam. Pastor Mike Novotny, everybody. The book is called Taboo Topics Christians Should Be Talking About But Don't. And as Pastor Mike was talking, I, I just felt impressed to read to you in closing the words of a 17th century Anglican priest named Thomas Traherne. I think this is a good place to leave the conversation today. He said, will you not live unto him? You must of necessity live unto something. 
and what so glorious as his infinite love. Since therefore laws are requisite to lead you, what laws can your soul desire than those that guide you in the most amiable paths to the highest end? By love alone is God enjoyed, by love alone delighted in, by love alone approached or admired. His nature requires love, your nature requires love. The laws of nature command you to love him, the law of his nature and the law of yours. You're going to hear me say this a lot this week as I fill in for Bill, but you were made by and you are loved by a big, big God. I am so grateful for the chance to interact with you this week. Walk in the confidence that you are loved by the Creator. Don't let taboo topics hold you down. The God of the universe is for you, and He loves you. I'm Than Bennett, in for Bill Arnold today, and we will talk to you again tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.